A few months ago, Aston Martin released a highly updated version of its much anticipated Valkyrie hypercar. Today I'm going to be going through an aerodynamic analysis of what these updates mean for the new car. As usual, we'll start at the front and work our way backwards. Now there's been quite a few different tweaks on this car, some are major, some are minor. Um, obviously there's a few practicality things, like if you look here we now have a bonnet opening of some sorts and we've always got the headlight over here uh, but we're of course not really interested in that we're interested more in what's affecting the aerodynamics on the car the biggest change around the front is the change in this front wing section here you'll notice in the old car that it was a flat wing that continued through the center section of the car still with a little bit of angle of attack on it whereas in a new section it cuts off here and then it curves there so we, what we have is a winglet much like a Y250 uh, generating section on a Formula 1 car now because there's a high pressure region on the top surface of this winglet and a low pressure region on the bottom surface of the winglet, what will happen is the airflow will try to spill around the wingtip and form a vortex that runs along the underside of the winglet and then is expelled into the free air to continue along the car. The next big change is the size of this foot plate. If we look here compared to the old design, look at how much wider the old design was compared to the new one. Now firstly I must apologize on my previous video about this car because I mistakenly talked about this being a tire weight control slot when in actual fact it houses the vortex from the spillover at the side and basically the curve is just a region where that vortex can swirl in. Running this vortex close along to the ground acts like a barrier against air that's trying to flow inwards. So why is the total footplate area smaller? Well, something that I didn't actually notice in the previous video but is now quite obvious in these lighter shots is that the entire front of the tire here is actually exposed and it looks like that was the case on the old spec as well. Generally speaking we try to shield off the front of the tire to deflect the air around it and reduce the tire weight traveling down the car. As to why you would want to expose the tire here well there's a few different potential reasons. One is this area of the tire generates a high pressure area in front of it. That high pressure area could theoretically be harnessed by this flat plate here. Of course, however, it's also going to interact on the underside of that section there. While air hitting the front of the tire will cause an increased tire jet down the car, if we have a large vortex off here, as well as several sort of uh, boards and guiding vanes back here to help guide the tire jet and keep it away from the floor, we should be okay. This is running quite a high ground clearance floor due to the massive tunnels, uh, so we're not going to see the tire wake being as influential. The other thing that I want you to note is that now that this is so small here, we actually start this further outboard on the car. And then if you notice as it goes back, it goes inwards. So we're actually deflecting the airflow inwards away from the tire on this side and blocking it off from the bottom. And if you look at the top, we're expanding the airflow that way around the tire as well. So as we're expanding the airflow, it will slow down the air in front of the tire a little bit and negate some of that effect of the exposure. It's still a very curious design choice and I'd be interested to see if Newey ever discusses why he did that. Although I did read in one of his interviews that he said that everything from the hip line up was designed by the Aston Martin styling group. So perhaps that is a styling choice. You'll notice that the top edge of the winglet is actually quite inboard and furthering that deflection line inside you'll see that when the wheel is steered over here it's not going to block off the inside of the wing so the low pressure surface of the wing which is the more sensitive side will always get clean airflow no matter what the angle of steer is. The other fairly subtle aerodynamic change is in this region here where you can see that on the old design it had quite a prominent flat section there. Now that section there would basically just be getting a high pressure region on the front of it which would lead to an increase in drag with no improvement in downforce. This section here is much thinner, much more like the leading edge of a wing, and so that high pressure section will be minimized. The final thing I wanted to talk about at the front is this section here, because Newey is now venting out there. So previously it was all closed off, so all the air in here just sort of built up, and I actually made a comment on the last video that I'm surprised he wasn't trying to vent out some of the high pressure area of the wheel arch. Um, while he hasn't vented over the top, he's obviously vented out here so the airflow comes in and then it will go up and then vent over the cabin that way. So that will relieve some of the high pressure air under there and should improve downforce not insignificantly. Looking from the side view now, you can see there's also additional venting in this region here. 
So of course, on the side view, there's a few changes that are quite obvious. One, the wheel's now filled in. Two, there's now a prominent roof scoop. Three, rear wing at a severe angle. Four, long diffuser extension. And five, change to the management strategy behind the front wheels. Regarding this wheel issue, Newey has actually said that these aren't the final spec wheels because while a flat wheel uh, filled in like this will give you very low drag, you can see here that all your brake cooling would have to be managed by your brake duct at the back. Um, you'd have to pump it in and pump it out, which is something that a lot of F1 cars do, um, but it's obviously advantageous to have some cutouts to, uh, to help the cooling flow. It's a little bit tricky to tell whether there's camera perspective or not, but it definitely looks to me like the front of that front wing is slightly lower than the old spec, uh, and this foot plate appears to be a little bit longer. So we've obviously got a little bit more front downforce being generated here by a larger and more aggressive front wing. I'll talk about the engine inlet and the rear wing a little bit later, but let's talk about this front wheel management strategy. We can see that we no longer have the foot plate behind the front wheel on the, the vertical vein, and we now just have a singular vein. Now, while it's not so clear from this shot, when we look in the side shot, we can see that this vein has a pretty significant angle outwards. Now, that's going to really help with directing that wheel wake out of there and helping with extraction from this region, which should help with suction from the whole front wing area. In the old design, this vein was much straighter. So you can see that this line is almost parallel with the direction of the car, and so it wouldn't be pulling that wake out and it wouldn't be pulling that air out for suction as well as the new strategy, which is what they've talked about a lot in the press release on Adrian Newey improving. Our side airflow management strategy is largely the same and the cooling intake system seems to be more or less the same. And as discussed previously, this foot plate will house the vortex generated on the side by the low pressure created inside those big Venturi tunnels. Moving to the rear, we can see some of the car's biggest changes, the most prominent being the massive change in diffuser strategy. Previously, behind the rear tires, we had this sector here. Now, you can see that that point there is about where this sits here. So in the new model, we basically just opened up the whole rear of the tires, whereas in the old model, we had this guidance vein. In terms of the primary diffuser, though, the biggest change is that massive lateral expansion. To be honest with you, it was hard to find two shots that compared very well between the diffuser sections, uh, but this is the best I could do, and this probably gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on. You can see here that this is fairly straight with the car with a little bit of lateral expansion. Whereas over here, we go along and then get a massive lateral expansion there. The profile through the center tunnel seems to be pretty much the same on both, although there now seems to be a little bit more of a cut down for the center tub. Uh, much like we were talking about before with practicality constraints, this is obviously getting more towards a real car. We also see that at the back, we now have a sort of drop down tunnel that's far more pronounced all the way to the back here uh, that is going to be housing the gearbox and stuff like that. And apparently it's a very custom narrow and short gearbox to package into this area, but you can see that it's still needed to have improved packaging over the previous design. In this region here, you can see what appears to be blanked out, but I'm certain would be the outlet for the cooling system. And this is something that I talked about a lot in the last video was that there's very little in the way of cooling outlets here. Uh, so this is just addressing a practical concern that wasn't really dealt with on the original model. You'll also see that the slope on this rear bumper section on the old one slopes down, whereas on the new one, it sits pretty much flat to a slight upkick, which is obviously going to be better in terms of downforce, because this is trying to pull the air down from the top, and that's trying to pull the air up, that's trying to pull the air up. It's not all working together, whereas in this case, everything is pulling in the same direction. We also now have the exhaust in a location that makes much more sense than the previous one, because while the previous exhaust would have still blown hot gas onto the wing. Uh, this new exhaust is directed far more directly at the wing, and it's also far, far closer. So that hot, fast moving gas is going to be jetted onto the wing with considerable velocity instead of mixing with the free stream air before it reaches it. Let's talk more about that lateral expansion because it's quite a serious level of lateral expansion. Now on modern Formula One cars, you do see lateral expansion to this level, but they also have a multi-element design with often two or three slots in the lateral expansion and they get far more free stream air blowing through this sector to help it expand out. 
As a result, you can see that the, the lateral expansion is probably only made possible by the fact that the ground clearance of the tunnels is actually fairly high. Uh, if you tried doing this on a low ground clearance floor, you'd almost certainly end up with separation from this region. So why is Newey doing such a radical expansion at the rear? Well, if you look at this rear wing, it's not exactly the biggest, and we have quite a prominent front wing at the front. So of course we've got to get aero balance, and presumably this car has a rearwards mass distribution. So what that means, we need more rear downforce. Now the way to get rear downforce, we can either get it from the wing, or we can get it from the under tray. If you had your under tray close to the ground, so let's say we have our ground plane here, and then have our under tray run close to the ground and then kick up with a diffuser, what will happen is you'll end up with a low pressure region around here. The problem that Newey faces is, is that if this is his ground plane, due to the fact that he's running his Venturi tunnels, what he's got is he's got a diffuser, the tunnels all the way up here, and then he's kicking it at the back. The problem is, is that all your low pressure is going to end up at the front that's closer to the ground, and while this kick can help you a little bit, you're going to end up with not as much ground effect here. However, if you run a massive lateral expansion at the back, what you're doing is you're essentially making this much, much, much steeper. Only you're doing it in three dimensions, which means you can support it from the side airflow as well, which means that you can get a big low pressure peak in this section of the tunnel, and therefore get that rear downforce. The other thing you can see from here is just how open and ventilated that front area really is. You can see that Adrian Newey has really addressed some of those concerns that I mentioned last time about venting out the area in the top of the wheel. The final thing that's an interesting design choice here is the nature of this foot in the diffuser. Now, it's quite odd to see a foot in a diffuser that curls back inwards. And the reason behind this is, is that if we have relatively speaking, a high pressure area on the outside of the diffuser, and then we've got a low pressure area on the inside, this of course causes the air to rush in and form a vortex along there, right? So normally, if we have a straight downside, the air will rush in and form a vortex there. If we have a foot plate like that, the air will generally rush in and form a vortex here. But if we have a foot plate the other way, like what we have here, the air will rush in and form a vortex up here. Now one, that means that this vortex is not at the floor level, so it's not sealing the air as effectively as it could be if it was down like this. Two, is that a vortex is a region of low pressure, so the core is low pressure. This means that this vortex acts on this surface and therefore sucks it up, creating lift. So what we're more looking at then is a much larger scale vortex that's going on, kind of like what's on an F1 front wing. So our airflow is rushing in from the outside, and this directs it along so that it feeds this way, and then we obviously have a vortex that's going like that, and this deflects this downflow of the vortex and keeps feeding it around so that the vortex continues to swirl the whole way through. So it's enhancing the total large-scale vortex through here, which means that the whole tunnel can remain at a massive low pressure region as it gets fed from that air from outside. We can also see up the top here that the air intake is a combination of sort of a knacker duct down and inwards and a scoop at the top. Now apparently the reason this is the case is because the knacker duct helps manage some of the spill flow when you're off throttle and stops you having a really bad basically build up of pressure on the front of the scoop that causes the air to blow around and then you get localized regions of separation on the back here. And so that's the logic behind having that knacker duct inlet there. And these new braking light details and everything are pretty much just aesthetic choices. You'll also see the back lip is now kicked up, which should provide a little bit more downforce and continue the effective span of the top surface of the wing across the whole car. The other thing to point out is this car doesn't have wing mirrors. If you have a look at the interior, we've got some screens here, and they are actually acting as the wing mirrors, so it's got cameras doing it. Um, unlike the Project 1, which has actual physical wing mirrors. And this, of course, will provide an aerodynamic performance benefit in terms of drag and disturbing the airflow downstream with no real penalty whatsoever. Well, thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button below and leave a comment on what you'd want to see from me next. Go and check out my channel and subscribe for more videos like this. And hopefully, I'll see you next time.